a lot of new initiatives come and sometimes they go. Uh, how do you sustain momentum for new initiatives in your organizations? You went first, last time, I'll take this. Uh, God love you. Uh, I, I'm not sure that we do this very well, but uh, if I was just uh, looking at some processes that we were attempting to do the other day that I remember we, we tried it three years ago, we tried it six years ago, we tried it nine years ago. Every time we tried it, it, it added value, so why does it not, why can we not sustain it? Um, so I think part of the issue is that if, if something is not invisible, if it's not something that, that you really take a look at frequently, it may become something that just doesn't continue. And we always like to have a champion of our uh, initiatives to, to make them sustainable. And if you keep that champion in place, that's great. But we're a changing organization. Sometimes the champions come and go. And the person that, that takes over may not be as big a champion of the, of the initiative. So those that are critically important to our business, we do try to put some metrics around to make sure that it's visible, that if something starts to change, that we, we do notice it. But it's, it's a challenge in a changing organization. Yeah, and that change of leadership and sponsorship is, is a, a, a challenge that I think most of us face at, at one point in time. And, you know, we don't see the challenge. When we're talking about building a new facility, we have a new, new facility we're building in Covington, Georgia. It's, it's quite large. Um, we're not going to stop that. Right. It's going to continue. It will sustain. It will get a lot of our good um, best practices, and it will get a heck of a lot of our bad practices as well as part of what's going on. Where I see our initiatives um, coming to a screeching halt is when they become softer in nature. They're not as visible on the balance sheet. Um, their, their activities around um, the softer skills, the leadership development, the, the cultural attributes, and a lot of that is I, we treat it as an initiative, and by definition, it, it has an end. Mm -hmm. um, we don't treat it as a sustainable process. The second thing is we spend so much time focusing on the results of what we want to see or the behaviors that we want folks to, to demonstrate. We, we forget that the thoughts and feelings that come along there that really drive the culture mm -hmm. take more time than we have patience for. And so just when things are getting good and you see results and behaviors, you think it's good enough and we move on to the next more pressing thing. In reality, we need to stay in that game a little longer and really make sure we're driving those underlying thoughts and feelings that are, that are going to make that initiative, not an initiative, but an ingrained part of our culture. And I wish that I could say, um, that we do this well. I wish I could say we do this well at my house. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> my 13-year-old is not doing his homework this week, apparently. So, um, <laughs> so we, I, we, I think I struggle with that, not only in business, but in, in, a, in, a, in a personal manner as well. Yeah, I, 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 uh, my, my first job was at National Semiconductor, which was at the time a, a, a big deal. It's, gone now. Um, and part of the reason it's gone is that the leadership just couldn't figure out how to motivate a dispirited company. And I remember going to an all hands meeting. So there were maybe 4,000 people at this meeting. And uh, the CEO, a guy with the wonderful name of Charlie Spork, Charlie said, uh, OK, we've had a lot of problems, but we've got a new initiative. And it is do it right the first time. And I remember looking around the thinking, we're done. Now we know what to do. And uh, right, that was the initiative, do it right the first time. Like, what, did that, what does that even mean? I was, you know, I was a year and a half out of school. I already knew that that was crazy. And, uh, and so you know, that lasted for maybe six months until everybody realized that it didn't come with any tools we could use. And, and then we were on to the next initiative and the next initiative and the next initiative. And I thought, um, you know, Tim talked about softer skills and culture, and that is the that to me is the secret sauce of how to make initiatives stick. It's not that you say we are now a Six Sigma company. It is the culture around being a Six Sigma company that makes Six Sigma stick. And whether you love or hate Six Sigma, like in some ways it doesn't matter. It's the cultural components of it and how you build that, and that takes time and it takes uh, that, again that constancy of purpose. So. You know, now we're getting down to these big ideas, innovation. We're kind of we figured out what we want to do, and somebody's got to do it. So, what would you rather have? A let's say a semi-talented person with a great attitude, 
or a super highly skilled person that doesn't play well with others. I bet we all say the same thing. Yeah, I'm sure we will. <laughs> I, will uh, I will give one extreme example. I, when I was at National Sem Semiconductor, there was one guy who knew how to design analog, analog circuits in the whole company like nobody else, and really nobody else in the world. And he had a corner office, uh, but he couldn't design anymore because the grass was getting too long outside of his office. And then he also wouldn't allow uh, lawnmowers because they were too distracting. So the company hired a guy who was a shepherd to bring goats <laughs> to mow the lawn in That's front innovation. of his office, which was a great innovative solution to a crazy person. Um, <laughs> so you can, right, I, you know, I think there is probably room at big companies for a couple of eccentric people like that. But by and large, working with people who have a great attitude, uh, who are trainable, uh, I'd take that any day over somebody who's difficult to work with. Oh my <laughs> Next. So, I think I'm by definition difficult to work with, so I might be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no goats, though, please. <laughs> I just thought I heard some uh, baying outside of. Yeah, I hear you. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a challenging question. And I think you know, you, when we're presented with an either or, we're, we're tempted to choose. And um, my answer is I, I, I do want some level of both in my company. Um, some of the eccentric, hard to work folks are like that because of how they see the world. And sometimes they're so far ahead in their thought process and abilities that, that it is hard for to get them to, to pull along. And if you put them with the, the, the person who has a great attitude but doesn't compare, you've got a, you've got a, a real challenge. But if you can harness some of those um, thoughts and, and, and um, the thinking process, innovation, the abilities of that person, um, and you can start to embed that a little deeper in the organization, either through process, tools, things of the sort, um, I think there's a place for both. And I think the other thing that you said, Andy, that was key, is in large companies, you have space for this. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Baxter has 70,000 folks in 126 countries. If we have a handful of these eccentric folks, that's fine. If you're a company of 300 and you got a handful, that handful hurts a lot more. Um, the, 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 the employee that, that challenges me most are the ones who think they have a good attitude and know they know everything mm -hmm. because they're neither. And, um, and a lot of times folks like that get promoted into leadership roles because the technical folks don't want to deal with them anymore. And then the folks that are working in the trenches doing real work don't want to deal with them anymore. And so all of a sudden you have these unaware um, people driving company. And you know, SME, this person over here, is one of the most ridiculous terms I've ever heard because everyone knows it means subject matter expert, right? It does not a lot of times. It means somebody management elected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's these folks that lack that self-awareness that give me the most headache. So. I have an example right now of, of a person like that that I'm dealing with. But with the, uh, the world that we're in right now and where our company is and the kind of knowledge that we need to have, I have to have this person. Mm -hmm. This person is incredibly brilliant and very fast to get to a solution. And we have to be in our environment right now, very fast moving. So I've uh, been, I'm struggling actually with what to, to do with him now. Um, he's in a leadership role and um, I would prefer him not to be. <laughs> um, I, actually, I actually wanted to move him into a role where he reports only to me and, and helps the organization reach quick uh, conclusions and solutions to problems, but does not have any direct reports. However, he's like you said, he's, he's one of these guys who thinks he's a really, really good manager. Mm -hmm. So I've, I'm stuck with this dilemma of um, what to do with him. So the solution I'm working on now is I put a layer between him and, his, and the organization that he manages, a layer that knows him well and kind of and can go toe to toe with they him know a how little to bit work with him yeah and so that's that's kind of the filter i'm putting to to keep him away from the the, the guys that that really can't go toe to toe with him but 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 if you do have that that layer that can do that and that can they know him well enough and they like him he's a great guy i mean he's a great character he just doesn't understand that most of the time He's at that solution long before anybody else, and he can't understand why they don't get there, why they're not there. 
And, and so these guys know that. They know how to deal with him. They know how to manage him. So this is my current solution. Maybe next year I'll get Susan to tell you how that's going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> but but we got to have him. He's, he's, so we've got to work a solution around it. And, and it would be demotivating for, for him, for me to put him in, in just a, an individual contributor role right now. I, I, sorry, I, I, I have to. I have. Uh, one of my very good friends now was my mentor when I joined IDEO, and he was the one person at IDEO. Uh, he invented the mouse mechanism. He invented the stand-up toothpaste thing. Like he is, he's a mechanical genius. Uh, he's also incredibly difficult to work with, and uh, and he's a yeller. And in an organization that's so collaborative, to have a yeller is like crazy. And yet, um, <laughs> he was the one guy that. Uh, you know, had he was so smart, and everybody learned so much from him that we also carved out a place where, uh, after a time, after he yelled at clients in a meeting for a while, you know, that's not so good. So he he stopped leading projects, um, and he became the uh, not because management said he's a subject matter expert, but the engineers loved him because he would bring the best out of them. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to carve out even in a small organization maybe one or two of these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, as we, uh, as we start thinking about uh, wrapping this up, there's one thing I really want to get to. And you know, here we have a few hundred organizational performance professionals. What's the one or two things that you would tell them to either stop doing, start doing, or continuing to do as you think about the kind of impact these folks would have on your organization? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're just quickly, um, training is not the solution to everything that ever has been. So first things first, learn to push back appropriately. Um, when, when, you know, Baxter last year had 3.3 million hours of recorded, quote, learning in their LMS, all right, that's 61 and a half hours per person per year. If you can cut 10% of that noise off the top, that's 330,000 man hours or 158 full-time equivalents. We can do a lot of good things if we don't overtax the organization. The second thing is perform uh, performance uh, professionals. Play a little hard to get. Don't make it easy. Speak the language of the business, but when folks say, can you do this, don't be the, the, the ever-chasing um, little happy dog that says, yes, I can do whatever you want. Yes, I can do this, and what will really drive the business is this here. And so if we can minimize the amount of pure training just for training's sake that we do, and you can align the processes that you guys are all brilliant at um, with the expectations of the business. So instead of a return on investment, a return on expectations approach, uh, I fundamentally believe we'll start to make a, a, a big impact in our business. Great. Andy? Um, there's a, in electrical engineering, there's something called impedance. It's the ability of a system to absorb energy. I'm also an engineer. Uh, and, uh, and tailoring your solutions, the things that you work on in your organizations, to the organization's ability to absorb it is really, really important. Um, a lot of energy bounces off when you have uh, however many hours that maybe don't point towards something or don't have that sense of continuity in the organization. So understanding the ability of the organization to move and to change is, uh, you know, I, if I would say anything, it's understand that, that mechanism. And Vicki? I'd say I don't have anything unique on this, but I agree with uh, Tim and Andy, and that is to, to make sure you continue staying connected with what the business needs. and. I'm, I feel very fortunate that our team is, is, is well aware of what we have to accomplish and, and they understand um, how to tie what they're doing to the results that we need. And the good thing is I think we have uh, performance improvement um, professionals that are they're also pushing back when necessary to the organization to ensure that they're focusing on the things that really matter. That's fantastic. Is this worth it for you all? Yes. Thank you.